thank you for everyone who's joining us right now. Uh, my name is Lily Jagodzinski and I am from Move United. I'm an event specialist and we're super excited to be here for the fifth and final adaptive snowboarding webinar series. We could not have done it without Captain Reggie here uh, and appreciate all the special guests that have joined us throughout the couple of weeks. Uh, as always, we're going to just go over a few housekeeping rules. Closed captioning has been enabled. You're more than welcome to play with the font. We'd love to see everyone's smiling faces, um, whether you're new or you're just coming in for the fifth and final time. It's great to see you. And this session is being recorded. If you haven't already checked out our Move United YouTube page, all of the webinars have been up there too, so you can catch up at another time. Um, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Kep to start off the introductions and uh, also introduce our special guest as well. Kep, you can take it away. Um, and you're on mute right now as well. <laughs> there you go. Thanks. Thanks, Lily. Uh, thanks again, Move United. This will be our fifth uh, segment of the webinar series that we've got here, uh, fifth and final. Um, any of the other ones that you've missed, uh, you can always check these out on, on YouTube. Um, we've had some incredible uh, guest panelists join us. Um, and today we've got Jimmy Sides, who's a Paralympian and um, retired Marine. It'll be, uh, that'll be adding a lot of commentary about what we're talking about today. Um, once again, my name is Kep, um, a developmental coach with the U.S. Uh, Paralympic snowboard team, and I'm an instructor at the Adaptive Sports Center here in uh, Crest Butte, Colorado. Um, we've got Reggie Showers joining us. We'll throw over Reggie, and then uh, and then over to Jimmy Sides. Hey, everybody! <clears throat> Excuse me. Hey, everybody! Thanks for uh, for joining us again today. I know uh, we'd much rather be meeting on the mountain, but uh, this is the next best thing in the era of COVID, and. Um, I just wanted to say thanks, like Kep said, to uh, Lily and everybody at Move United for all the amazing resources and information that they've compiled to bring you uh, an opportunity to fast track into the world of competitive uh, adaptive snowboarding. Um, I am a bilateral baloney amputee. If uh, if you hadn't get a chance, if you didn't get a chance to join us in our previous uh, webinars, uh, and uh, I snowboard. I work with Kep and I work with uh, Move United as far as coaching is, uh, is uh, concerned. And uh, we just want to see the, the adaptive snowboard community thrive and grow. So we want to share our experience uh, with you to, to help you fast track uh, to the winner circle and to, uh, to get to that podium. So um, we got an amazing guest with us today, Jimmy Sides. Uh, I just found out that Jimmy is on a snow patrol. He's on a ski patrol at Copper Mountain, which is uh, my favorite mountain of all time. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jimmy. He can tell you a little bit about himself. Uh, I told Jimmy if I do get in trouble with while I'm riding fast at Copper, I'm dropping his name. Hopefully they won't rob my pass. They won't snatch my pass. Uh, but uh, Jimmy, you are muted right now. So unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself to everybody, all of our, uh, of our, our guests here. Thanks, Reggie, and uh, no promises on that pass. Uh, <laughs> hello, everyone. I'm Jimmy Sides, uh, U.S. Marine veteran, did 12 years in the Marine Corps, got injured in 2012, and then participated in my first ski spec in December of 2012, where I learned how to snowboard, and then from there became a Paralympic adaptive snowboard racer and was good enough to join the team for the 2018 Paralympic Games. I competed in Border Cross and Bank Slalom. And as Reggie said, now I am a ski patroller at Copper Mountain with as my second year. So thank you all again for being here. Awesome. We got some video of Jimmy um, tackling the course. Jimmy, you want to talk a little bit about uh, what we're seeing right now? Yeah, so this was the, uh, the border cross course in Pyeongchang, South Korea. And uh, this was a very, uh, although it looks mellow, very technical uh, course, uh, man-made snow, which if anyone has not been on man-made snow, it is very grabby and very scary. It is like riding on concrete. Um, so yeah, very uh, intimidating off the bat, but once we dialed it in, I think everyone got more and more comfortable with it. Uh, that last hit was was something else. Nice. Uh, but yeah, very, uh, very, very wide, very long course, but uh, very fun. Yeah, so these courses, like Jimmy mentioned, um, 
lot of them are man-made snow. They blow a lot of snow in these areas uh, to build these courses. And what you see on television screen doesn't necessarily translate to uh, how fast uh, and how big the jumps are um, once you're on the course. And it's, uh, it's definitely uh, challenging conditions. Um, both Korea and Sochi had a lot of man-made snow. And it took, um, it took quite a bit of time for our higher level athletes to, uh, to even adapt to the new conditions because a lot of the athletes that are training to become Paralympians aren't necessarily training in the, these uh, type of conditions. And these are similar conditions to what we'll be looking at um, for the next games in, uh, in Beijing for uh, 2022. So it's, uh, it's definitely one of those things to become an elite level rider, you have to uh, you have to be an all round rider and and really try to get uh, on varied terrain to prepare yourself as best as you can for uh, for these big courses. Um, so yeah, we'll go to this first slide. First slide yeah, to, here to, to complement what you said, Kip, um, and just to stress the importance of um, experience. And experience comes with time time on snow you know a lot of uh, the, the elite riders they ride at some of the the the, the, the biggest mountains uh, in the country but the snow is basically always the same you know it's powder um, out west um, and they don't get a chance to ride on ice um, so with time you know if you have the resources to be able to travel to different uh, parts of the country to go to different mountains to experience uh, varying conditions varying terrain and ride on some ice uh, that'll give you the experience and the confidence to be able to be ready and be prepared for uh, these different track conditions when you go around the world. Uh, and those track conditions are the same for everybody. You know, they really don't care. It's a, this is what you get for everybody. So you need to be uh, experienced on how to ride on them. And it just takes time to build that, uh, that, uh, that experience, that confidence. Um, so this is definitely a commitment. If you want to do this, it's going to be a, 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 a commitment. Um, if you want to be successful at it. But uh, over to you, Kep, about transitioning. Well, that's a great segue into what we're talking about here for trying to find a program that fits you best, trying to find a mountain um, that you can ride, where you can get your training in, where, uh, where you're comfortable and can build the skills that, that you deem necessary for trying to uh, fulfill your goals. Um, becoming a Paralympic athlete is one of the, the toughest challenges um, that anybody is ever going to face uh, as a as a professional snowboarder, um, you know, like Jimmy echoed before, it's uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of time, a lot of everything that goes into this, um, and you know, finding a program that works best for you can uh, can require you to move to to a new area, um, to relocate your family, whatever it is, kind of put some things on hold um, for your career. Uh, just to get involved with this, this higher level. Um, so one of the things we just want to encourage everybody is to do your research, try to look uh, for different programs that might fit your, uh, your character. Um, but Jimmy, Jimmy spent quite a bit of time at Adaptive Action Sports, which is based in Copper, where he is now, which, you know, after, after becoming a Paralympian and, and uh, being with the U.S. team and all the stuff that he's done there, he's been able to stick around um, at the same mountain and now he's got a, a career path that's that's come of it um, and I know that uh, Spivey's joining us today as well Spivey's still um, at Copper doing training um, you know both these guys uh, took it seriously to become these high level athletes and they're still they're still living it daily now um, and giving back and being a part of um, programs and, and part of the mountain where they are which is really important thing to, to think about where, um, where you're going to end up um, looking for a good program. That's got qualified coaches. Um, that's going to help you get into your classifications. It's going to help you get into competitions. Um, I mean, that's, that's the number one thing. Um, like I mentioned, these guys are at adaptive action sports at copper. Um, there's quite a few other programs out there. Um, the NAC has a competitive program, uh, national ability center, which is in park city, Utah. Um, the NSCD, which is in um, Winter Park, um, is also had some snowboarding programs in the past. They do have a really high level ski program. Um, so it's just seeking out some of these uh, some of these programs that can help you achieve your goals and, and get to where you want to be. Um, 
and then just going through the rest of this year, you're, you're looking for some programming that's going to help you um, with your training, getting on snow, that's going to uh, put you against some of the other best athletes, um, maybe in your field, if you're an upper arm uh, amputee or lower leg amputee. Um, so you have people you can ride against to push each other and get better. And um, overall, you want to be looking for a place um, that you can call home for a while. Um, and as we go through some of these slides, we'll, um, we'll keep adding in a few more things um, and, and keep you updated on some stuff here. But one of the best things to check out is, um, once again, is that Paralympic.org um, site. And there's quite a bit of information on snowboarding events and things that are happening uh, and, and how to get involved with some of these programs. Uh, we'll jump to that next slide. Um, equipment, both these guys can chime in. Um, you know, having your equipment dialed is gonna make you the best athlete possible. That consistency, um, that, that go-to um, feel that you have on your snowboard, getting it set up right, um, is, is gonna make you the best athlete possible. Uh, Jimmy, you have anything you wanna add in on this? Uh, yeah, for sure. Having all your equipment dialed in is, is going to be the, the key. Um, having extras, extra bindings, extra boots. Uh, a lot of us traveled with three to six boards uh, for warm up runs and then for actual race runs. Um, and then a lot of stuff that I saw early on was not having tools and backups for your prosthetics. The lower limb categories are, are always breaking something on their lower limbs prosthetic setups and if you don't have the extra screws or those backup uh prosthetics or feet or whatever it is that you got you're not going to be able to compete and you're going to lose out on points um so yeah having it's it sucks it's going to be a heavy bag but it's you need tools for your for your equipment and then tools for for your prosthetics and then um to go along with equipment when making adjustments to your equipment i learned on i learned early on and trying to help out my teammates with the that were in the lower limb categories is don't tweak six things at once. If you're having problems with your toe side edge, tweak one thing at a time. That way you know what you're working on and you know what's working and what's not. Um, a lot of times I would see guys change their width and then change their, their pressure on their foot and then change something else. And then it's still not working. And now you don't know really what made that change or didn't make that change. Now you're having to start over from scratch. So our idea at Adaptive Action Sports was start from the ground up and work on one thing at a time. That's great That's information great there. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm sitting here nodding my head with everything that Jimmy had to say. Um, one thing I'll add, though, um, is when it comes to wax and, and wax technology, I didn't know anything about wax and a snowboard um, when I first started snowboarding. And there's some great uh, informational videos on YouTube that you can you can watch you can just do some research on the internet about uh, wax um, and how to wax your board you know what tools you'll need and then ask your friends you know ask your coaches uh, or the program coaches ask them hey how do I wax my board you know and and take responsibility for all your equipment making sure all your screws are tight um, you know none of your straps are torn or broken um, I've seen guys in the gate uh, that are ready to, to make a run and, you know, their, their, their bindings are just as loose and I'm saying, Hey, 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 you're, you're, and then they, they go through, uh, you know, they get a go and they take off and go down the run. Um, so it's really up to you to make sure that your equipment is, is top notch. Your equipment is sound. Your equipment is tight. It's set. Um, so you can go out there and have the, the safest and, uh, and best chance to, uh, to, uh, to be successful. Yeah, and to echo that, uh, Reggie and I travel together a lot. Um, and the night before we're on snow, if Reggie's traveling in, he's putting his boards together. He's putting everything ahead of time. And, and that's something else to – we always want to encourage uh, athletes that are, that are going through this process is to become that professional. Um, if you show up and you're five minutes late uh, on snow, you're kind of five minutes behind all day for things. So it's, uh, it's being ahead, it's being prepared. Um, it's having all that gear set and it's, it's being, uh, the best athlete you can, um, and, and being prepared, which is, uh, which is really important, mm -hmm. uh, on to races and competitions here. Um, same thing. Once you get in with some programming, a lot of times, um, uh, 
groups will travel together for classifications and for, for races and, and all kinds of stuff. So if you are in with a, with a higher level program, um, chances are you, you've got an administrator that's already looking at a schedule of like, hey, we're going to go here to get classified. And there's also a couple races that are attached to that. Uh, when you go through classification, they'll go through a full medical process with you. And then they'll also put you on snow to evaluate things um, and, and give you the best um, classification possible. Um, and that's one thing to consider when you're going into this is making sure that you've got all your papers um, lined out from your doctors. Um, you've got uh, the ability to rely upon maybe um, an administrator or a coach or somebody else that can kind of help you out through this process. Um, and then really just making sure that you're classifiable. Um, you know, amputees are, um, are a little easier to classify, so to speak, because it's, it's a visual. There's uh, measurements that can be made. Um, there's some other, uh, some other classifications that are out there with uh, CP and, and some other things that, that might not be as clear cut. Um, so having as much information on your side as possible to make sure you get classified is really important. Um, once again, we talked about this before. A lot of times these classifications are, are um, overseas someplace. Um, we haven't had too many uh, U.S. or Canadian classifications lately. Um, so to get classified might cost you um, cost you a chunk of money to go overseas and, and to race overseas as well. So um, anytime there is an opportunity to get classified in the U.S., it's good to jump on with that. Um, and like I said, make sure you have all of your papers and, and everything set before you get there. Um, Jimmy had a little bit. He was going to um, share with his classification process. Yeah, so um, just kind of harp on what Kep was saying. Pat, if you've got those unseen adaptive parts of you, um, have medical papers ready. Make copies of all your medical stuff, everything documented. Maybe go see your primary care if you can before you go and get some documentation handy. Um, I've seen caregivers come with their veteran spouses. That's another good as a backup. Hey, this is for real. I'm his caregiver. Um, international you're obviously going to have your passport but take your passport with you to classification because your u.s driver's license is not going to fulfill their needs as far as ids um yeah be over prepared is what i always try to tell everybody take all your stuff if you got a folder a suitcase stack bring it all the more you have the easier it is when you get there and you can get classified and you can start racing and earning points right away yeah once again there's more information at um at the uh, paralympic.org site there for a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, we were talking about this earlier. Reggie was looking to get classified at an international spot uh, a few years ago, and it, it just kind of fell through as far as being able to travel at that time. So if you do get a chance to get classified, that gets you ahead of the game. Once you're classified, you usually um, are never going to be reclassified unless they come up with a new category. So your classification should stick with you for a while. It should be as fair as possible. Um, and like we mentioned in the other webinar, if you have uh, maybe an upper and lower limb um, deficiency, um, they'll, they'll end up trying to give you that opportunity to see which category you feel like you fit best into and want to compete in. So um, yeah, once you get classified though, you can start getting into races and can start your journey towards being a, being a Paralympian. Um, training schedules. Um, same thing. We're going to throw this back over to Jimmy. Jimmy's been um, with the U.S. team and been with uh, Adaptive Action Sports, which is which has helped propel him um, to being be an elite level athlete. Um, he's going to explain some of this for you guys. Yeah, so I, I fully trained from 2013 up until the Paralympics in 2018. Um, one thing I didn't realize, uh, it's a full-time job. Being a full-time athlete, it's not just six months on snow. You're, you're working out in the summer. You're cross-training. I was mountain biking, skateboarding, wake surfing. Um, anything you can do to stay in shape and get ready for that season, that's what you have to do. Um, training days are rough. We're putting 120 days on snow in a season between training, races, and travel. 
Um, so those recovery days are key. We always implemented recovery days. We only trained Monday through Thursday officially as a team. And if you wanted a free ride or do your own thing, those other three days, that was on you, but you had to be ready to perform on that following Monday. Um, and then, yeah, strength days, I would take a month off of at the end of the season, um, eat all the fatty stuff I wanted and drink a bunch of Coke and, and do all the nasty stuff. And then right back May 1st or June 1st, I was right back in it. I put in, in six weeks of just straight strength training legs and core. And then you go into your cardio routine for six weeks and then you go and do hit workouts right before you get on snow. So, um, it's, it's a year round full-time gig. If you want to be a part of this, this lifestyle, um, you can't just take the summers off and expect to come back banging gates first thing. Um, and with that's the nutrition, like I said, I, I gave myself a cheat month. And then after that, it was back to eliminating those, those foods that are bad taking in carbs and veggies and limiting the beer drinking as much as I like that. Um, it was, it's all part of that. If you want to exceed and perform at this level, you need to, to do all these and it's a year round thing. Jimmy, do you have any uh, advice that you can share with us about how to fund uh, your training? Um, you know, th this is a, a full-time commitment, like you said, and, you know, outside of snowboarding. I mean, you know, you do have a life, and you have bills and you have cell phone, you have insurance. Um, God forbid you get an injury and you have to, you know, pay for some, some type of medical uh, attention. Um, how can uh, one look for um, funding uh, to train? Yeah, um, right now the internet's still our best friend. Get out there and look for those nonprofits. Look for those adaptive programs. A lot of them now are doing winter and summer programs and you can get in with those programs and they can help fund a lot of them um as kep said there's the nac um one that one he didn't mention was the breckenridge outdoor education center out here in colorado they are a full-time year-round nonprofit that provide bikes and and sit skis and snowboard equipment and everything for any any disability or adaptability you can think of um Get out there, research, look up grants, look up loans. Um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of us work part time, a couple part time jobs in the summer. Um, the, the joke when I was in was join snowboard racing and go make hundreds of dollars for five <laughs> months. Um, yeah, it's going to be a struggle. Uh, I, I am fortunate as a disabled veteran that I, I receive income without having to do anything. Um, but I still worked. I had a family to provide for. So, and that also helped with the training. Um, and no one says you have to have top notch equipment or go to a gym. You can get in your garage, in your room outside and look up. YouTube's got hundreds of videos for everything you can think of from hit workouts to lower limb workouts to everything under the sun, go to a park and sweat your ass off and get strong. Um, but yeah, do your research, get your name out there. Um, and uh, the social media nowadays, Facebook, Instagram, there's pages all over. Try to get you, try to get your feelers out there and, and get you, get recognized and, and jump on board of these programs. Yeah, one other thing I'd like to add in with, um, along with cross training, nutrition, all the stuff that goes goes along with being a professional athlete, is a lot of our athletes end up um, seeking um, team psychologists and stuff to help them with the mental aspects of being prepared for all this, for juggling a family, for juggling a job or two or three to provide for, for these opportunities. And then just being that professional athlete. Um, a lot of the athletes are um, uh, public speakers. And so they're on the road traveling a lot for some of those uh, engagements in between races and, and training and all this stuff. So it's um, just having that overall balance, um, and just trying to be the, the best athlete you can be can, can uh, be benefited by having somebody to talk to, by, by unlocking all those little keys um, and, and really being the best athlete. So uh, there's a lot of things that go into your daily training schedule, your weekly training schedule, um, and all the way through your yearly training schedule, like Jimmy said. Um, if, I could add, point. if I could add one last thing to, to this conversation, when it comes about funding as well, um, you touched on a good thing kept there. You said a lot of athletes uh, do public speaking. Um, there's tons of corporations out here that are dying, dying to hear your story. 
and they will pay you thousands of dollars for you to come and share your story. And now in the day of COVID, you know, you could actually share your story via uh, a webinar or Skype or Zoom or Teams or whatever uh, platform you're using. And these co corporations will pay you thousands of dollars to come and motivate and inspire uh, their team members. So that's a good way to, to uh, drum up some, some resources, some funding for your training. And if you let them know that you are a, a Paralympian in training and you know, you're, you're trying to get onto uh, the, you know, the, to the Paralympics, the, you know, the world stage and compete, I mean, they'll be more than happy to help you. Um, so you just gotta be a little ingenuitive and, um, and reach out, knock on some doors. You know, every company has got a Twitter page or, or social media page, reach out to them, send them a bio about yourself. Um, and and um, yeah, just, just knock on doors. Um, there's money out there to be found. Yeah, thanks, Reg. Um, so, so on a program and admin and administration side, um, recruiting athletes is really one of the toughest things um, for our jobs. Um, you know, as a coach, as an instructor, as adaptive athletes with Reggie and, and Jimmy, we're always looking for people that are out there that are, that are um, interested in snowboarding or interested in any sports um, to try to get involved with, uh, with higher level snowboarding. If you, if you come across somebody who's really good at, uh, at wakeboarding that you see it on a video or skateboarding or some things like that, there's a lot of things that transfer over, but it still takes a lot of time on snow to become a professional snowboarder and become a Paralympic uh, level athlete. Um, so we're, we're always looking, um, kind of scouring um, uh, programs and everything else and doing a ton of outreach to try to find new athletes. Um, once again, we really try to we really try to preach the fact that you've got to love snowboarding all the way through um, to really take this on as a job. Um, because once it becomes a job, sometimes you lose that uh, you lose all that um, uh, ah, just that that it, when it's a job, you have to live it day in day out. You can't walk away from it. It's uh, it's just something that's in your in your core. And we're hoping that we find those athletes that are that are really wanting to live this lifestyle and want to want to take it on. Um, there's a lot of athletes that we run across that um, we try to view them on snow, um, whether it's a ski spec or some of the other um, events that we have throughout the season. We're always trying to find some athletes, always trying to get eyes on them to see if they're riding um, pretty well. Um, I know Spivey's on here right now. Um, rode with Spivey a long time ago at ski spec. Um, and that was something that we got to share that experience every year. He was coming back. Uh, he was getting a little better, a little better. And at some point he was like, Hey man, I think, uh, I think I really want to try to uh, pursue this full time. And then he got involved with the program. Same with Jimmy. Um, Jimmy was living in California, um, had a family, had everything else going and had to relocate to, to Colorado for a while um, to really uh, become the best athlete possible. Um, uh, and once again, just to touch on the resources there. There's a ton of resources that are out there um, for grants and some funding and some stuff like that. Um, but really just using Move United is, a, uh, is an opportunity to find some local programming and uh, try to find that, that passion um, and love for snowboarding is where you, you really want to start. Uh, you guys have anything else for this one? I don't think so. Good to go. Yeah, and uh, like Reggie was saying, right now uh, with COVID, um, ideally we would be meeting everybody on snow right now. Um, we're, we're meeting everybody through the virtual world. We're trying to share as much information as possible. Um, we're trying to share that stoke for snowboarding, get people out on the snow individually so they can get out and get moving. Um, trying to share as much information as possible to cover everything that we've all been through all of our experiences um, to help, to help guide you all to get on the snow and, uh, and help get into some programming. If you're on the admin side, it's how are you going to run a program um, in this new world that we're living in? Um, like Reggie mentioned, there's, um, 
there's a lot of different formats of um, linking up face to face through the computers now um, to get this information. And like Jimmy said, there's a ton of YouTube videos that are out there and these will be on YouTube for everybody. So hopefully we can get all this information to, to everyone. Um, but it's still up to the athletes and it's up to the programs to get people on snow. And um, with the COVID restrictions and considerations right now, um, you can get a lot of people out on snow safely. Um, Jimmy's a, a, a ski patroller at Copper. He's definitely got some uh, information to share on how to make an event run um, smoothly, keeping everybody safe uh, and keeping everybody uh, distanced and wearing masks and everything that's kind of uh, necessary now to still run these races and, and get these competitions going. Jimmy? I think you're on mute there, Jimmy. Sorry. Sorry about it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so every mountain's going to have their restrictions in place. Here at Copper, we have, um, you're required to wear a mask in all the villages and in the lift line mazes. Um, and as far as the competitions between USASA and in the Team Summit Kids, it's a local um, ski and snowboard uh, group here. They are actually upping the ante and requiring all their athletes to wear masks full time and to stay away from each other at six feet if possible, even when they're outside above the venues anywhere. That's just the precautionary codes that they've enforced. It's just to keep everyone from not getting sick. Uh, I would suggest if you're traveling outside of your home state to a new resort, get on that resort's homepage and check out their, what they're doing. We on a copper. The first thing you look at a copper is COVID-19 restrictions and we're open. Uh, read those restrictions, see what you need to bring, see what needs to be done so you don't get in trouble. Um, I've had to pull a couple of Team Summit kids and once or twice an AAS rider. Um, your, your riding and skiing um, emblem, you have all of your brands on you. You are not just another face in the crowd. You are sticking out. So when you go to these mountains as a, as a team or a group, you need to abide by the rules and set the example because you are professionals. Yeah, and to highlight some of that, um, I know within our program here at the Adaptive Sports Center, um, you have to do testing prior to coming in if you're going to um, be here for uh, some training on snow or and with our program. Um, there's COVID tests you have to take prior to getting here and some things that are uh, in place uh, prior to even getting to, um, to a program. And so like Jimmy said, check with, uh, check with some of the programs you're checking out there um, first before you get there just to make sure you have all those bases covered. Um, it's definitely one of those things. This is a, a ski trip or snowboard trip costs a lot of money. So um, making sure you have all those bases covered before you get there is, is one of the best things to start with. Um, you know, and once, once you got it into a program, once you get into a program, once you've got that bug for uh, snowboarding, once you get into higher level of uh, competitions, once again, you're looking at um, a lot of money that's gonna go into this. Um, international travel, um, all the gear, everything that you need to get to this higher level is, uh, is gonna cost quite a bit of money. So making sure that you're set for everything uh, ahead of time is gonna set you up for success. Um, a lot of our competitions during the season end up getting bumped because of um, lack of snow in Europe or, or some of the places where we're supposed to be going for these uh, competitions that are on, they're on the schedule in August. Um, nobody really knows if they're gonna have snow in uh, Spain in January. Um, so a lot of times we end up having to uh, adjust our schedules for the IPC calendar and uh, even for our local USASA races, if we don't have enough snow um, and the conditions aren't right. So. You know, that's something else is, like I said, to be ahead of your schedule here. Um, this season, a lot of the competitions have already been canceled. Um, they just had a race in Finland. Um, and I heard from one of our athletes that, um, that they had some issues with the French team that weren't abiding by the rules. And they, uh, they sanctioned the entire French team. Um, so the team traveled to Finland and um, nobody got to race. Uh, and they actually... Uh, got fined and sent home. So, um, you know, that's, that's one of those other things. Hopefully you're involved with a good program um, before you get into your national team. Um, that's going to keep you safe. It's going to keep you uh, 
ahead of the, the uh, COVID restrictions and considerations um, going forward. Um, you know, and that's one of the things too with classifications. Sometimes they'll schedule a classification, and if they don't see that they're having enough numbers that are going to show up for something, they might cancel it. So you might not be able to get your classification until the following year, which means that your points are frozen and some things like that. Um, so if you're actively pursuing this as a uh, professional career and really trying to get to the highest level, these are all these things that you want to try to take care of um, at the beginning. And then that, that helps everything else going forward. Um, yeah. And you guys have anything else you want to jump in, share with any of this stuff here? You covered it all. You and Jim yeah. Good job. Yeah. All right. I awesome. Can in here. <laughs> yes. Um, this is Lily from Move United. Uh, Kev and Jimmy and, and Reggie, thanks so much for the information on everything from the admin <laughs> side cool. and the athlete side. Um, what I would love to kind of dive into further is from a programmatic standpoint. Um, if I have a program that I want to start or I'm, I have a certain amount of athletes and I think they can really start diving into some more elite competitions, what are some considerations that I should take when looking to book my athletes into races? Um, are there certain ones? Is there a number of quotas that you think they should compete in each year? Any details and information you're able to provide would be great. Well, uh, I can go first here. There's, um, there's definitely getting involved with the right program can get you set up for success. Um, if you're working with coaches and with a the staff, um, they're hopefully going to have your best interest in mind of trying to keep you safe trying to keep you on your, your uh, goal, goal tracks there for uh, becoming a higher level athlete. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of athletes that come to programs that just say, hey, I just want to be a Paralympian. And they don't realize how much time uh, off the snow, on the snow that goes into, into this. Um, so working with your coach and with your programs to make sure that they've got you on track um, for becoming that athlete that you want to be. Um, you know, we've definitely seen some athletes like uh, like Jimmy and Spivey that have um, it's taken quite a few years. Um, uh, they didn't have an opportunity to race in Sochi. There was no upper level um, or upper limb um, event in Sochi. Um, but over the next few years, when it became um, uh, the the event to go to for these guys for the the Korea Games, they were able to put in that hard work and that time to become those professional athletes. Um, so, you know, sometimes you'll have an athlete says, Hey, I, I want to be the best. Um, it's going to take some time. It might take a couple years before they actually achieve some of those goals. Um, so it's being realistic. Um, like I said, trying to find the programs that's going to um, support you the best and help you achieve those goals um, is really going to help you out. Um, there's a ton of programs that are out there starting with recreational programs first, getting that bug, getting, getting that snowboard love um, is where you want to start. And then as you start to get better, um, you know, actively seeking some higher level snow, snowboarding specific programs um, will help you get to those goals. It's a great question. Um, I know Jimmy, Jimmy's put a lot of time in, like I said, um, he's relocated his family, um, sacrificed quite a bit to kind of make it to that next level. Um, same with Reggie. Reggie, uh, I know when he was chasing the team for a little while there too, was um, considering all those things, um, you know, getting a private coach, uh, going to a program, those are all those considerations. So hopefully these guys have a few more things to add in. Go for it, Jimmy. You're on mute, buddy. Oh, you want to hit um, the unmute button? Unmute yourself, Jimmy. Yeah, I can also help you too. Happens to the best of us. There you go. Oh, it there keeps right. muting me. Okay. Um, yeah, once you get dialed in with that program, um, one thing that happened with me is that my, my program didn't have enough coaches to facilitate me at the level when I was able to go and join the U.S. Paralympic team. So I had to make a decision on how I was going to go about that. And um, it sucked. I had, I hurt some feelings, but I had to do what was right for me. 
And so I went and joined the U.S. team on multiple occasions so I could up my writing and get to that level that I thought that I needed to be. So it comes back to doing what's right for you. If you feel like you're not getting what you want, verbalize that. Say, hey, I, where is this or what, what's going on with that? And if it comes down to it, you may have to find some private coaching as Reggie was doing, or you may have to leave that program. It's going to be part of part of the deal. But at the end of the day, this is about you. Um, I can't stress that enough. That was my whole goal was just to go to the Paralympics and I wasn't going to let anything get in the way of me just attending those games and doing the opening ceremony and riding for the red, white, and blue again. Um, it's on you. You are the only one in charge of you and you're going to be the ones to make it happen. So if you've got to make those tough decisions, be prepared to make those tough decisions. Yeah. With that being said, um, a lot of programs go through different coaching changes. Um, we have a lot of, uh, quality coaches that are involved with adaptive programs. Um, and we also have a lot of able-bodied coaches that, that kind of transfer over to help get adaptive riders riding to the best of their abilities. Um, within the U S team over the last, uh, six years, we've had quite a few uh, coaching changes. Um, and the, the thing that's constant, like Jimmy said, is you becoming the best athlete possible, you figuring out what's your best track, um, for reaching your goals. Um, Jimmy trained with the U S team on, on a couple occasions, got some extra, um, some extra tips there that helped get him onto the team. Um, you know, those are all things to consider. Um, you know, same thing, going to a program where they have ability to work with you. Um, if you're the fifth or sixth or seventh person on the roster and they're not really seeing you as, um, an investment, um, as a Paralympic athlete or whatever, Maybe that's not the best fit for you. Um, there are some big programs that are out there. Um, there's also other avenues of, of becoming the best athlete possible, working with able-bodied coaches. Um, uh, a lot of coaches that are out there um, will treat you as an able-bodied athlete. They will find the best way to train you to make you um, into the best athlete you can, that you can be. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of coaches that don't see a disability as a challenge. They see it as an opportunity to make somebody into a professional athlete. And uh, that's the, the uh, other side about the programming that's out there and available now that becomes uh, more and more available now that it's become a Paralympic sport for the, the second time and going to this next Paralympic cycle. Um, there's a lot of former World Cup racers uh, and, and elite level athletes that are becoming coaches now so they can give back. Um, and the international field, like, uh, like Jimmy and Reggie know, the international field is doing the same thing. They're putting their best resources in to their athletes. Um, and that's, we've seen a lot of changes over the last few years with, um, like in Jimmy's division, the upper division is one of the toughest um, divisions that's out there um, as far as the number of athletes that are really, really close together on times and competition. And uh, that's because everybody's seeking the best, uh, the best training possible. So, yeah. If I could Great add question. one last thing to this, just like from an ins inspirational standpoint, um, if this is what you really want to do, I mean, really, really dig deep down inside your soul. If you have a passion for becoming a, a, a Paralympic athlete uh, or becoming the best, the best, adaptive snowboarder um, that you can possibly be. Um, there's an amazing amount of resources that are here for you. I mean, just look at the people that are here on this webinar and for the last five weeks, uh, everybody has consistently showed up, you know, Michael Spivey, Jimmy Sides, um, Kep, myself, everybody at Move United. Um, there's a wealth of information. And these are some of the athletes that if you so decide to join a program, go out and train, um, go to some, some competitions. These are the athletes that are gonna be in the gates right next to you. And they are here to offer their expertise consistently because we as a community just wanna help each other. And we wanna see this, this sport grow. We wanna see the community thrive. We're looking for, uh, we're continuously looking for new athletes to, uh, to, um, to foster in the next generation. Um, so this is an amazing opportunity for you. If this is what you want to do, you know, the resources 
for for and for me, um, I kind of got in on snowboarding on on the the back end of things. If I had started a little a whole lot earlier, I'm like in my twenties, um, my path would have been a whole lot different. But I was chasing motorcycle racing and girls and stuff back then. But um, I had an opportunity from uh, my company that I work for, a prosthetic foot company. Um, they offered me the funding to go train. I was like, yo, you know, if you want to go do this, you know, go for it, do that. So that was, that was really, really tempting. But at the same time, I had a family, uh, I had family responsibility that I had to juggle. And it was really, really difficult to be able to, to justify traveling, you know, all around the world, chasing these, these races and competitions and getting classified and, and I mean, it was really, really difficult. You know, you had this carrot right here, you know, with the, with the resources and, um, you know, yeah, we'll help you, but I didn't have time. Um, but you really got to dig deep down inside your soul and say, this is what I want to do. Um, and we are here for you. That's why we're here today, uh, to offer you the guidance, to offer you the coaching, um, and, and the resources to be able to make, uh, some of your dreams come true. So. And we believe in you. We know that you can make this happen. And uh, we have faith in you. Thanks, Reggie. Great summary of inspiration. And, and we really appreciate that. Um, Jimmy, can you tell me how many races did you compete in uh, in regard to each year? Like when it's not COVID time, what would you estimate you competed in? I'd say, so actual races. Um, so there's halfway through my my era um we had new zealand in august and then we would go to netherlands and then then for there it was usually a toss-up between spain finland um at that time we had some canada we had canada was always on the books i would say any given any given season would be anywhere from three to six venues depending on funding and snow and stuff like that. Uh, the ones that were always on usually were Netherlands, Canada, which is a great venue to go to to earn points and get classified if they bring that back. And then just now recently, since I think the year before the Paralympics, uh, we've been going to Finland and uh, I think Norway was on the docket, but I don't know if that got canceled. Uh, yeah, so anywhere between uh, three to six venues a season. And then within some of those, venues you're racing border cross and bank slalom so you were doing a day of bank slalom and then a day of border cross and sometimes two days of border cross depending on how many points they had allow allowable for you for each athlete to obtain um yeah so anywhere from five days at a venue to two weeks in canada and then within that season as well you're still trying to chase um usasa races so Maybe um, a race at uh, Copper Mountain, uh, Cooper, Ski Cooper was mm -hmm. running some races. I know we, we hold a uh, USASA border cross race here, plus um, getting into whatever bank slalom events you can get, get into. There's uh, like Slash and Burn and, uh, and Steamboat and some things like that that are out there that everybody's always kind of chasing um, within the United States as well. So, I mean, it, it's a busy season. Um, it's a lot of local travel as well as international travel. Ready, go ahead. I have a question. Um, Jimmy, if you can answer um, for, for all the, um, the guests and, that are here, when you show up at a race, say you're going to Big Sky, you're going to Canada uh, or the Netherlands or wherever the competition is, you know, what's the first thing that you do when you show up at the, the mountain, you know, when you get off your, when you get out of your, your, your car or if you're in a, a bus or whatever, however you get to the mountain with your gear, um, what's a typical day like uh, for competition or let me, let me back up what's a typical weekend like or or n during the weeks so sometimes the races are during the week midweek so um, tell me what's a typical you know one two three days look like from start to finish uh yeah that's a great question actually uh i learned early on from some of the u.s paralympic uh guys that uh a routine is a necessity it keeps your mind in focus it keeps your mind on the task at hand and not not to say that you shouldn't be worrying about family or bills, but you're there just for one thing, and that is to compete and earn points. So, yeah, I typically get off the plane, you get your gear, you get to your hotel room, and the first thing I'm doing is unloading all my gear, 
and get my stuff set up. I like to get all my base layers, all my gear laid out. That way, every morning it's not a rush to find, oh, where's my top? Oh, it's going to be hot today. I need to wear this. Um, and then you're, you're setting all your gear up and getting them to your wax tech. You got to break everything down to make everything fit. Like I said earlier, you're taking anywhere from three to six boards per competition and two pairs of bindings. Everything's going to be broke down. So you need to set up your gear that, that day, get it done and get it to the wax tech to get waxed and get ready to prep. And then from there, it's a routine. Find out what time you're eating. Food's a necessity. You're going to burn a lot of energy at these, at these mountains and at these training venues. Um, I made it a priority to find out when was chow, when, when were we able to eat? what was free what wasn't free um that so on and so forth and then hammer down a sleep schedule um you're traveling with your group uh the european hotels are not as lavish and big as american hotels and most of these places you could touch your your roommate on the next bed over while you're laying in your bed you need to figure out those part those teammates that are better suited for your sleeping abilities sometimes you got to change rooms um so yeah I would say figuring out your gear first and foremost, get that food and nutrition and the sleep schedule. And then from there, make it a routine, make it set a certain time to get up. What are you going to have for breakfast? Do you need 10 minutes for you time to go sit on the balcony? Um, some guys practice yoga or meditation in the morning. Some guys just like to go eat by themselves. Some people are social. Um, it's all on you, but develop that routine that works for you as, as an athlete. Um, and dial that in. And then uh, I like how you brought this up. It, it, once the races are done, it's not over. You're doing video review. Your, your coaches should be videoing you. You're going to have to go get done with racing, shower, change over, get some food in you if you have time. And then you're into an hour to three hour sessions of video review, critiquing your teammates, getting critiqued, learning what you did wrong, what you did right. And then course memorization. Everyone was drawing courses. So I remember vividly taking pen and paper with me to every course. So I could draw all these courses out because my short-term memory is not that great. Um, and then you're in bed by whatever time you feel you need to be. So yeah, it's a full day and uh, need to be prepared for that. And you're dealing with jet lag in certain cases. You're dealing with, um, with food that you're not familiar with. Uh, Different times. Maybe, yep. Yeah, maybe languages that you're not familiar with. Or, I mean, there's a lot that goes into this to become that professional athlete. And uh, it, it sounds glamorous to travel around the world and, uh, and and be a part of the U.S. team and part of that experience. It's a lot of work that goes into it. Um, and that's the exciting part is um, once you get there, it's um, it's rewarding. It's fulfilling. It's a ton of work that, and effort that's been put into it. Um, but being able to share those experiences with uh, – with your friends and teammates is, uh, is one of the best feelings possible. So, yeah. Is there any other questions out there that you guys have? Uh, yeah. I know there's so, still a few people that were on. Thank you. Feel free to, of course, send questions in via chat. Um, but on top of that question about uh, the daily lifestyle kept, are you able to tell us what it is like from a coaching standpoint? As soon as you get to a weekend for a competition, what's your role as the coach and what should they be prepared for? Um, this will help for program admin side as well as coaches coming up. What should they do? So as a coach, um, everything that Jimmy just detailed, um, we're usually up an hour before anybody else and usually going to bed an hour later than anybody else um, <laughs> to make sure that everybody else has got all their information that they're prepared as possible. Um, so, yeah. On the coaching side of it, um, there's a lot, Lily, like you know, there's a lot behind the scenes that go into this. Um, there's a lot of work that we do um, to help prepare from booking flights to um, getting those, uh, those food deals set up and some of the stuff that's um, set for our World Cup competitions. Um, I, there's so many of those elements that are in there. Um, uh, bus travel, uh, renting cars, all the other things. Um, not only are, you know, as a coach, not only are you a coach, you're also, um, a brother, a sister, uh, a psychologist, a driver, uh, a, a chef, uh, you know, a Sherpa. A lot of times, you know, you're carrying, uh, when athletes are finished with their competition, um, so in certain cases, athletes are going straight to a medal ceremony and their backpack and extra snowboards are still up on the mountain. So, I mean, there's just 
there's a lot behind the scenes, which makes it rewarding for us as coaches, um, knowing that all that work that's put into play behind the scenes and on snow um, really gives that athlete the best opportunity for themselves to just focus on being an athlete. Um, Cause that's ideally what we want is the athletes to compete their best and not have to be stressed about too many things outside of that snowboard course. And um, you know, Jimmy and Reggie and I, we've all traveled together and uh, you know, like, like Jimmy highlighted, um, it's finding people that you can room with. It's, um, and that's another thing. It's, uh, as a coach, you're trying, to, you're trying to get people in certain places where they're, um, so, that, so they're gonna be able to be the best athletes they can be for a weekend or for a week or whatever it is. So it's, um, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, like I said, that's a rewarding side of it. Um, there's a lot of admin paperwork, a lot of stuff that goes behind the scenes, um, international travel insurance, to, um, you know, grabbing a, a, a quick book of trying to figure out some language for wherever you're going. I mean, it's, uh, it's really cool. Um, I'm, I'm really proud um, to share those experiences with, uh, with Jimmy and Reggie and Spivey. Um, and then there's some other names that I saw on the, uh, on the webinar right now of people that we've worked with at Ski Spec. Um, all in all, it's the same process um, that everybody kind of goes through. And, um, you know, the first step is just trying to get on snow and make it happen. So uh, that's the exciting part for us as coaches too. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, another question that we had is from a recreational standpoint, recreational therapy standpoint, how can we help future clients if this is something that they want to pursue? Feel free, anyone to begin. Like as a, as a, being re uh, referred by a recreational th a therapist or as like recreational therapy, like a uh, recovery through, through sport type thing, I'm guessing. Yeah. So um, uh, my apologies from a recreational, like the therapy portion of it. Uh, what, okay. what can you do? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's pretty much how I got started. That's um, Ski Spectacular My was my first event. Um, and we were, they were just trying to get kids out of the hospital that had been injured. Um, so yeah, I think it's great. There's, there's definitely those programs out there that only pertain to the recreational therapy side. They don't have a elite level program at all. So if, um, if that's something that you're interested in, yeah, by all means pursue that. It just goes back into researching those, those uh, programs at certain uh, resorts and mountains. Yeah. And like you said earlier too, Jimmy, um, with the internet, there's always ways of reaching out to athletes um, via social media or whatever it is to, to, um, to ask some athletes, how, how did you do this? What programs did you get involved with? Um, what was your path to getting to the Paralympics? And um, you know, that's, if you can find some recreational athletes that are out there that are, um, that truly love snowboarding or passionate about it, um, that next step, is um, if they're doing pretty well with it, that next step is to uh, to try to guide them to uh, to a program or, or where they're going to succeed for their next goals. Um, you know, here at the Adaptive Sports Center, we work with quite a few athletes um, that we can get up and moving rather quickly. Um, you know, Mark Dervais is an athlete I worked with here that um, he um, he was here as a, a recreational program participant. And then I said, hey, man, you're, you're pretty good at this. Um, you ever thought about trying to compete um, internationally and maybe compete for the U.S. team? And he was really excited about doing that. He was with the U.S. team for a while and did really well. Um, you know, and that was back before um, back before the upper limb category was as big as it is now. And Mark was a little bit older, but he helped um, he helped with Spivey and, and Jimmy and a bunch of other athletes helped build them into being better athletes. And, um, you know, that's always like, like Reggie said as well, there's, uh, we're always looking for newer athletes. There's a lot of athletes that have been out there before they've been down this road. Um, and there's, there's plenty of, um, uh, athletes that are willing to answer those questions and help people get into that next level. Thank you. Um, and this last question, similar to the rec therapy question, what exercises or cross training should someone be focusing on if they're just coming out of the hospitals? Uh, should they be focusing on balance, lower leg, uh, stability? Jimmy, any information you're able to provide? Uh, 
<laughs> that's a very all of uh, the above. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's all going to be. I hate to say it, it's all going to be athlete dependent. Um, yeah. uh, balance and core for those for those TBI, brain injury, cognitive issues. That that's, would be probably where I would start. For anything orthopedic wise, it's it's going to be balance and strengthen whatever you need strengthen. Most likely your legs and your core. Um, the thing I would recommend first is is work on work on your strengths get strong first and then do cardio because if you do cardio first and then you go and build strength, you're going to be adding muscle and then your cardio is going to be affected is how I look at it. So I would do six to eight weeks of building up and building all that muscle and then cardio and train on that new muscle. So you're not flip flopping and you're not actually taking a step back. Um, but yeah, it's all going to be athlete dependent and what their ultimate goals are, honestly. Yeah, riding a snowboard for me, I've discovered muscles that I didn't even know I had in my body. So there's going to be different uh, varying terrains, um, levels of terrain. It, there, I think you know, anything you can do to strengthen your body as a whole is going to benefit you. And you're going to need it in some way, shape or form on any given day out on the hill riding a snowboard. Yeah. And then all in all, there's no replacement for snowboarding except snowboarding. That's so, true. Like, once again, we're here to encourage everybody to get out on snow, um, take this journey, be adventurous and, uh, and give it your best shot. Um, there's a lot that goes into this to get to the highest level, but you know, everybody started at a recreational level at some point and, um, you know, been able to, to climb that ladder. And that's, um, that's why we're all here today is to try to share that information and, and hopefully encourage you all to get out on snow. Um, once again, it's great to see Spivey on here, Zach, uh, saw Jason Moore, uh, Timmy Brown. I think, uh, I think Tim and, uh, uh, Jimmy used to work together. Um, so there's sort of a lot of, a lot of familiarity that's here though. Um, it's great seeing, um, seeing a lot of, a lot of the names and faces on here for the webinar and uh, please share this with everybody else that's out there. Uh, pass it along. That's going to be on YouTube. Uh, Move United's done an incredible job. Lily, Alexis, uh, Emily, everybody else that was involved has done a ton of work behind the scenes to put all this together. Um, we've been talking about this for years with some athletes and with Reggie and I, um, and it's good to get some of the content out there. Um, there's a ton of information, um, a, a ton of, resources for sure that are out there as well um anything that we can do to help out reach out to us and uh get out on snow <laughs> yes kev you could not have wrapped it up any better um so thank you for for doing it uh, the only other things that i wanted to add is we actually have an elite team training grant out right now we are looking to give out a hundred five hundred dollar training grants to athletes between 13 to 24 years old Right now, our applications are low, and so if you have athletes within your programs or you know other athletes that are interested and uh, meet those qualifications, we've put the link in our chat. You can also go onto our website, moveunitedsport.org, and then type in Elite Team Training Grant. Uh, but we're really trying to get more athletes on the move, whether it's in snowboarding or other sports. Snowboarding is an awesome sport to get involved in right now. You can still get on the mountain. It's not as um, precautionary as some other sports. So we really appreciate everyone's time and expertise, Jimmy, Kev, and Reggie. Um, it's a pleasure to see you guys again. And thank you for sharing all of your knowledge. Check us out on the Move United YouTube page for the other organizations um, that have, or the other webinars that we've done. And all the member organizations that Kev and Reggie and Jimmy have talked about, they're all already in our network. And so it's really just connecting the dots, finding what works for you. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. You'll also be receiving a follow-up email from me, just like you have every other week. Um, but we really appreciate everyone's time. So thank you so much. Um, I'll stay on just for a few more moments to get some links. And um, you're more than welcome to leave the meeting at any time by clicking the leave meeting button on the bottom right of your screen. But thank you and have a great day.